something like this, I mean, we are having a 75 events, and these 75 events are essentially on multiple domains uh, of uh, 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 sciences and technologies that the nation is uh, uh, looking for. The nation will get kind of a benefit from it. And uh, uh, it is also done by under the Ministry of Science and Technology, where all the uh, what we call the uh, departments, uh, whether it is Department of Science and Technology, Department of Biotechnology, Department of Scientific and Industrial Research, under which the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research also comes in. Uh, all the uh, what we call departments are basically uh, involved in it. And I'm so happy, I mean, in many of the events, many of the ministries are also uh, uh, taking part actively in this particular event. Which is clearly making a kind of a, a circularity uh, in terms of uh, industry, academic, and research institutions, and uh, 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 the, uh, the, the government uh, called uh, enabling uh, some of the challenges uh, that our country is currently facing. And uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the purpose of my presentation in the next five minutes, uh, five or six minutes or so. Uh, is to broadly introduce about the organization of CSAR. Uh, and uh, for those people who are uh, attending from CSAR, they may not be needed. it. But uh, I am told that, that there is a lot of the industry uh, fraternity are also connected on this particular event. We have, uh, not only I mean the speakers, there are many other industries that are also been invited for this particular event. And for all of them, I mean, uh, to give a kind of a brief idea about what CSAR has been doing. And uh, especially in terms of the uh, chemical sciences. Uh, so I just thought giving a kind of a, a, a first right to so just go to the next slide. Yeah. Dr. Kanna? So I mean, as it goes, as it goes, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. As it goes, uh, uh, so I think I think I, I I just wanted to say about uh, uh, the CSAR lab. Uh, CSAR labs are broadly uh, classified uh, in the, uh, five different segments: uh, uh, chemical segment, engineering segment, information sciences segment, clinical sciences segment, and biological sciences segment. These are the broad uh, areas of uh, uh, of uh, uh, what we call uh, the domains. In which largely the CSAR labs are, are working. And at this, as on date, there are 37 laboratories that are located across the country. And the number which is given in the brackets indicates the number of labs in each of the cities. Uh, so, uh, I will, I will, okay. okay. So, I think, uh, I mean, uh, this organization, CSAR is an organization, it's a pre independent organization, uh, which is uh, 1942 born. Uh, as India is celebrating 75 years of uh, independence, uh, CSAR is celebrating 80 years of its uh, uh, what call, uh, presence. Uh, and uh, the fundamental uh, endeavor with which this organization started was to connect between the uh, what we call uh, research institution and the industry back to the end of a strong academic uh, uh, what we call uh, influence. Uh, that is the uh, objective with which this, this, uh, this particular organization was started. And there are several success stories in the last 18 years. Uh, CSAR has uh, 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 rendered. And I think uh, every product uh, uh, I mean, uh, that we are using in our rooms or uh, we are using it in our uh, public, uh, and there is a kind of uh, uh, somewhere or other CSAR technology has been associated with it in the last 18 years of its uh, presence. So uh, the, uh, these are the uh, 37 laboratories which are basically uh, 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 what we call located across the country, and uh, I just wanted to visit uh, this particular lab. As you uh, see, uh, we belong to a kind of a chemical sciences laboratory, the CSAR Central South and Marine Chemical Research Institute, which is located in Bhavnagar, Gujarat. Uh, it is uh, uh, one of the CSAR laboratories in Gujarat, which is working exclusively on chemical sciences laboratory, and there are nine chemical sciences laboratories that are uh, 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 what we call uh, present, which are catering largely to the chemical sciences laboratory. And uh, to make the kind of an leap uh, for the, uh, uh, working uh, uh, to kind of a, a cross uh, uh, disciplinary and cross uh, uh, ministerial linkages, uh, the CSAR has now, I mean, uh, uh, in the last few years, uh, it, it is uh, largely, I mean, to, to get a kind of a, uh, what you call, connectivity sector, it is working largely on the 18th 
uh, which are basically aerospace, electronics, instrumentation, and strategic sector, agriculture, nutrition, biotech, chemicals, and petrochemicals, including leather, civil infrastructure and engineering, ecology, environment, earth and ocean sciences, and water, energy and energy devices, healthcare technologies, mining, minerals, and metals, and cheap labor. And if you really see uh, these domains, uh, almost cover the entire spectrum of uh, 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 the, uh, the, the common man's uh, needs uh, 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 through uh, different ways. Uh, uh, and if, uh, the, the sector which uh, we will be talking about is on the chemicals and uh, 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 which sector is doing better. So, uh, if we were to basically talk about the vision and goals of uh, this particular uh, chemical sector, please. Uh, we wanted to lead uh, Indian uh, uh, R&D on chemicals with the focus on developing benchmarkable technologies that are economically, environmentally, and socially acceptable. I, in fact, I mean, uh, uh, the point which uh, uh, the chief guest talked about is on the uh, more of a what you call environmental and sustainable solutions are very, very key uh, in this particular century. I mean, the 21st century will be largely governed by uh, 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 two major uh, concerns. Uh, the solutions that are basically provided should be sustainable and it should not be affecting our planet any, uh, 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 any longer. Uh, these are going to be having a kind of a significant impact, whether it is for any sector, and chemical sector is no exception, with a less carbon, energy, and water to, uh, uh, to create a create kind of a sustainable chemical industry. And uh, we have something like around uh, six verticals. Uh, uh, if uh, one were to basically look at it, uh, largely agrochemicals and pharmaceuticals, performance chemicals and smart materials, petrochemicals, uh, uh, coal based biomass, any kind of a carbon source uh, to chemicals and fuels, that, uh, I mean, uh, which includes uh, fuels also, many chemicals and specialty chemicals, polymers and sustainable bulk chemicals, and specialty and leather chemicals. These are the uh, large sub verticals where our, uh, what we call, uh, our chemical science and laboratory, not only the uh, what we call that, the nine chemical sciences laboratory, there are many other laboratories that are also associated, roughly around 11 other laboratories are also associated in some way or other, uh, which works on uh, uh, chemicals and its allied uh, interfaces. Uh, and these uh, laboratories will be working on these particular domains, uh, which will, uh, what we call, uh, uh, essentially develop competency based uh, technologies, uh, processes, and products. Uh, uh, that is going to uh, what you call make kind of a relevance to the industry space. And uh, I just wanted to give a kind of a, a very recent three examples where I mean the technologies are largely translated into a kind of a commercial opportunity. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, one of the technologies is on the isobutylene derivatives, uh, which we have uh, what you call uh, 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 for which our commercial plant is uh, uh, um, under operation and construction. Uh, is on the uh, what we call uh, polymerization metal green, uh, the kind of a photos and transfer and electric capacity by uh, inertia organics uh, based on the CSCR technology. And also, I mean, uh, there's a kind of a manufacturing of acetic acid from polyic acid, where a kind of a pilot facility is being uh, what we call initiated, and a commercial plant will be basically coming up and op will be operational uh, by 2023, uh, which is kind of a first time a continuous process is basically deployed. Uh, on the uh, manufacturing of this particular chemical, where we are uh, slowly uh, going into a kind of a sustainable uh, chemical industry, adopting uh, uh, newer uh, what we call processes and newer uh, what we call approaches. And the last one in the right is that on the trash technology, uh, uh, where I mean, a uh, kind of uh, uh, as uh, uh, he was uh, mentioning in the opening remark, uh, self reliance in potash is going to be a very, very challenging task of, of the uh, N3K. There is going to be the biggest uh, uh, what we call uh, task, uh, uh, considering the kind of uh, the resources that are available, and also the, uh, the difficulty in taking the potash from those resources and making this potash to be basically acceptable for the plant to absorb. All these are going to be a very very critical challenges for the years to come to solve. And one such example in the plant one, one on the right hand side, where I mean the potash is uh, recovered uh, from a, a distillery uh, spent for. Which is considered as a kind of a, a kind of a trouble for all the displays, which is also having a kind of a potash uh, roughly to an extent of around 1 to 1.2 percent. And this was basically recovered. And I'm very happy to see that uh, this particular plant, which is operating at a capacity of 60 kilometers per day, and this uh, uh, plant is uh, uh, using uh, uh, what we call uh, uh, roughly, I mean, uh, uh, um, 
uh, several hundred tons of uh, 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 cash uh, to start with. And our, uh, our uh, what do you call uh, our uh, scale of import is in the millions of tons, and our scale of uh, what do you call even if I were to completely uh, what do you call uh, uh, deploy such kind of innovative technologies uh, 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 in total in all the display areas. Uh, Still, we would be basically covering only roughly around 10 to 12 percent of uh, uh, potential requirement of our day. And uh, so the challenges are still there. Uh, uh, and these are classic examples where I mean the industry connectors are reflected. And these are some of the areas I'm crossing the time. So these are some of the areas that, uh, which are uh, uh, largely, I mean, uh, we are uh, uh, I'm going to take our focus on it. I don't want to read uh, these things, but I've already covered it in my uh, opening remarks. And these are the kind of a detail uh, uh, which uh, which uh, which is uh, uh, what we call uh, 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 on the specific details of these six verticals that I talked about it are all basically working. Uh, and the one which we are going to talk about in this particular conference is on the uh, marine chemicals and fatality in uh, We have it in the uh, morning session on the marine chemicals and in the afternoon session on the fatality in organics. And I sincerely wish. Uh, the industry participants uh, to have a kind of a bit more vibrant uh, interaction and the uh, uh, the, the government, uh, 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 what we call uh, uh, entities uh, and departments uh, to have a kind of a uh, what we call uh, a broader understanding of the requirement, especially in the chemical sector, uh, and how we basically work together, synergize it, and uh, uh, deliver the goals which are necessary. And with this, uh, I mean, I conclude here, and for any of the theories. Uh, I mean, uh, this particular talk is available in all the social media platforms, common social media platforms also. One can always, I mean, look at this uh, and then they can be in touch with this uh, uh, for consensus. Thank you very much. Over to you, Mr. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Kanman, for uh, uh, your views on CSI, 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 and the wonderful work that it has been doing in the field of chemical sensation and chemical. Now we move on to our next uh, guest, our uh, next speaker, Dr. Kamran Kamran, who is Senior Principal Scientist, CSIS, CSM, CRI. Dr. Arvind Kumar did PhD in Chemistry from Kurukshetra University. He is currently serving as Senior Principal Scientist and Divisional Chair at CSIS, CSM, CRI. He is also an honorary professor of the Academy in the Faculty of Chemical Science, uh, uh, Chemical Sciences at SIR. SIR. Dr. Kumar visited Germany under uh, a BAAD fellowship and USA under CSIR Brahman Research Fellowship. He has published over 140 years reviewed research papers, holds several patent book chapters and popular articles in magazines. He is recipient he member of the CSIR Rural Technology Award 2008, DST International Grant, Professor D. Nasipuri Memorial Award 2016, etc. May I request Dr. Arvind Kumar, and he would be uh, throwing some light on salt technologies and importance of return as feedstock. Dr. Kumar. Hello, uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. You are yes, audible. Sir. You're audible. And slides are also visible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Day. And first of all, I should uh, thank uh, all the speakers and participants and welcome all. Uh, I shall be presenting all the developments on salts and marine chemicals from CSM CRI on the behalf of all my researchers. The topic is salt technologies and importance of return as a feedstock for marine chemicals. So marine chemicals feasibility starts once you know salt process is over. So these are the basic contracts of the now, I shall be talking about the uh, salt scenario, Indian as well as global manufacturing process in the day. For those uh, you know, who are not uh, known for uh, salt manufacturing processes, then the main idea is to utilize sea bitter as a resource for bulk marine chemicals. That involves potassium chemicals and the fertilizers for bitters. I shall be talking about CSM CRI's technologies footprint. 
the regression chemicals, another strategic bulk chemicals obtained okay, from marine chemicals, and then I will put in some compressive remarks. So, if we look at the salt scenario, more than 80% of solar salt is produced from sea brine in India, and we utilize subsoil brine for around 10%. There's small amount of salt is produced from lake brines and very little from rock salt. And if you look at the global salt production, India stands third with 23 million metric tons. So we produce roughly 10% of the global salt. And salt producing states, Gujarat is the major salt producers with 76% of the total salt production, followed by Tamil Nadu, Rajasthan, and other states produce only 4% of the And annual consumption, if we look at you know, around more than 50% goes to the industrial applications. Half of uh, the half goes to human consumption as well as exports. So, recently we are exporting a good amount of our salt. So, that way, as the Chief Guest Energy said, uh, in salt terms of salt production, India is a bit self sufficient, but after production of salt, we are not utilizing the bitum for many chemicals. And industrial uses more than 50% goes to the food ash industry. So industries and then followed by glass industry and then other applications. And if you look at the demand of the salt, so every year four to five percent demand is there, and that is mostly for the industrial applications, global players for much. So very briefly, I will cover this slide. Uh, the salt manufacturing process is basically a conventional, you know, evaporative process. It's used crystallization of different salts from seawater. We did brine in reservoirs, large reservoirs. Then it is concentrated in condensers. Then salt crystallizes in a narrow density range. So between 25 to 29. Degree bone is roughly, you can say, the concentration of salt in the seawater. So in this range only, we get the pure salt. And after recovering of the salt, we use this nickel to store in reservoirs again. That is the bitter, basically. And that is not being utilized uh, in Indian for this. So, what uh, you know, the salt producers do, they discharge all the concentrated you know, bitter after getting 70% of food in the So, that is the main focus how to utilize uh, this bitter for the production of potash chemicals as well as manufacturing. And if we look at the resource of, uh, you know, the sea return for marine chemicals, it's a huge resource, basically. At least 50 meter cube of sea water produces one liter of common salt. The similar amount of return is being discharged. And if we consider 33 million tons of, you know, the salt which is being produced currently in India, so additional 5 million tons of the salt is there in return. We have Resource of 4 million tons of magnesium compounds, 2.3 million tons of magnesium sulfate, and then KCL. This can be in the form of uh, sulfate or as well as chloride. So, roughly 15 to 20 percent of the requirement you know, of the Indian imports can be mitigated if we utilize all uh, you know, the bitter which is available in India. And again, there is one more chemical growing, uh, which I will not be talking in this video. And if you look at the potassium chemicals, so these can be converted into either potassium sulfate or chloride, then again, magnesium chemicals in different forms, hydroxide, oxide, metal, etc. And this right side graph is you know, the concentration of different marine chemicals. So it becomes feasible once salt is being harvested. So all the you know these marine chemicals say. It is magnesium or potassium, they becomes feasible and economically viable for the recovery once the salt is being harvested. So this is the global scenario of the potash production. So the maximum production is uh, you know the Canada is leading with 51%, followed by Russia, Belarus, China, others, Germany, Broader, etc. So India does not fit in this picture basically. Since we do not have any, you know, natural resources of potash, but we have huge resources in terms of our winter, looking at our salt production capacity. And India's requirement is also huge. Four million ton and one billion dollars we are spending on, you know, our requirements. 
the production potential is six to eight lakh tons. So that accounts roughly 15 to 20 percent. So in this direction, huge efforts are needed to be made, and we really need to utilize the return which is produced after the solar sun production. Solar sun production activities are very organized nowadays in India. So we can you know utilize our return resources to make the partial requirement of our potash production. And in which form of the potash should be obtained? So it is purely governed by the uh, you know phase equilibrium of size. So depending upon the composition of the return obtained. So we have two kinds of return. Mostly you know the C return is containing a good amount of sulfate. For example, greater amount of pitch or any other you know coastal area which is containing sufficient amount of sulfate. So that can be directly concentrated to a mixed double salt, like kinetic kind of salt. So from which we can easily accept potassium the form of potassium sulfate. Another kind of you know potassium is nitrate of potassium (ACL). So if you look at this picture, LRK, this is you know very deficient in salt uh, sulfate concentration. So this kind of brine can be concentrated into a double salt called darnellite. Which is a double salt of potassium chloride and magnesium chloride that can be processed into KCL. And if we uh, look at the CSM CRI technologies, so we, we have utilized return in two ways one is through evaporation processes, another way is through extraction processes. So, in terms of uh, evaporation processes, you know, we need to Utilize return to crystallize mixed salt like kinetic type of salt or carnelic type of salts. And these two mixed salts, they can be you know, converted into different kinds of fertilizers like cement. So this can directly be used as a fertilizer as well as this can be further processed for potash recovery. And this carnelite, which is used you know, from uh, sulfate deficient returns. Can be utilized for processing of KCL. And if you look at you know right side of uh, the picture is the extraction based technologies. These are useful where evaporation is very soon. So return is highly concentrated with salt concentrations. So the evaporation is a little bit difficult. So in those areas, these extractions are very useful and can be used to extract potash in terms of PQSO4, KCL, nitrate. And you know any kind of uh, potassium based chemicals can be converted using extraction based techniques. And this is the part of the journey of the CSL CRA because since it's a very you know old laboratories since 1954, the institute is working in these areas. So classical technologies are mostly based on the evaporation techniques. So we started with recovery of KCL, then sulfate of potash along with magnesium oxide. Then it was integrated with sulfate of potassium, the ammonium sulfate. And then finally, you know, we embarked on the journey for recovery of potassium chemicals to uh, extract it. And this, this picture is very important. This graph, you can see the relative humidity with C prime concentration. So the areas which are having high humidity, say more than 60%, the extractive technology is extremely important. And Areas which are you know having relatively lesser humidity. For example, you know, there are several areas in India which have uh, the humidity lesser than 50 percent. So those areas can be easily utilized to concentrate winter into mixed salts and then for processing of potassium elements. And as far as magnesium chemicals are concerned, this is you know another because it's a huge resource for these chemicals also. And again, the picture is same for you know as it was for potash chemicals. So we are highly dependent uh, in this sector, and uh, the production is again led by the China. More more than 800 tons of magnesium chemicals are produced from China. It's roughly two third of the world. Basically, they have you know very good resources in form of magnesium. Then followed by Russia, US, Israel. Again, you know, India is not saying in this picture, but you know, our requirement is roughly 60,000 tons per year. And mostly, you know, for effectively great high quality material required for uh, you know, uh, very uh, 
crucial sectors like sale, SRCL, etc. And this requirement is met uh, to the imports. If we look at the key challenges is to get high purity uh, magnesia with less volume uh, quantity. And uh, theoretically, if we utilize all our winter resources, we can meet all our requirements of magnesium payments. You can see the global import and export around 1600 million US dollars imports and exports are equal. Not only you know our uh, uh, domestic demands, but we can enter into export sector in case we utilize our own resources of the magnesium and can be obtained in the various forms in the form of oxide, magnesium hydroxide. Uh, so you know one million ton is uh, produced in the form of uh, magnesium hydroxide, and three million tons is produced in the form of magnesium chloride, and only three million tons of magnesium is produced in the form of magnesium sulfate. So all these categories of magnesium based on bonds can be easily done through processing of bitter. Uh, Presently, uh, you know, the process involves precipitation of magnesium, the magnesium hydroxide, and then uh, using lime and uh, lime. Magnesium hydroxide is treated in two ways. You can easily get it with hydrochloric acid to generate magnesium chloride. And we can get it through heating at high temperatures to get magnesium oxide. And again, magnesium oxide is reacted with HCl, chlorine, and I like this magnesium chloride. Magnesium chloride is used as feed stock for electrolytic generation of magnesium metal. So this magnesium chloride is again in you know, a process for magnesium metal, which is again a good requirement. The production of magnesium magnesium salts has reduced in importance because. You know, we have uh, very good uh, resources in China, this is magnesite uh, and dolomite mines. So, it's uh, very cost effective to you know, get magnesium products from those kind of resources. But magnesium hydroxide is still produced from seawater, be it China, Japan, Ireland, or US. So, the seawater is still the source of magnesium hydroxide or magnesia, which is a very good quality. So, CSLCRA has uh, you know, made a good uh, footprint. Uh, in terms of technologies of magnesium hydroxide production. So this involves, you know, intermediate formation of magnesium hydroxide, which is, you know, through the reaction of magnesium chloride in light. And we have, you know, addressed the challenges of getting low volume content with magnesium. And our strength is, you know, to produce magnesium hydroxide, which is having greater than 99% purity. And we can integrate this process with potassium fertilizer technology. And the magnesium produced at CSMCRI has been tested at several places, and it is quite suitable for refractory and other applications. And the idea is, uh, you know, uh, we, we need uh, industrial partnership for technology scale up, beneficial, and financial assessment need to be worked out in collaboration of industry partners. So in these sectors, we would like, you know, this country uh, to address these uh, issues. And uh, I will close uh, my uh, presentation with this remarks so we can use Britain as a resource for uh, as a recovery uh, study. India has yet to take full advantage of significant economic potential from salt bitters. So, a lot of well, you know, salt is produced, bitter is generated, so we have to take advantage. And salt producers should not discharge any bitter estate, they should embark a program of cleaner production of different building chemicals. Because it is simultaneously addressing environmental as well as the objectives. We need to identify potential commercial products which can be extracted from bitters that are, you know, high volume, high value, strategic chemicals which can be extracted, particularly potassium salts and magnesium salts. We can integrate, you know, this salt technologies through magnesium oxide, potash, bromine, which are commercially viable. And sea bitter is a universally preferred raw material. Although there are a lot of you know, magnesium and other sources are available, but the purity which we can get from you know, the sea bitter they never matches. And there are several products and product combinations which we can domestically use and we can also export if we you know, uh, go for uh, the harnessing of bitter resources. We can supply potassium sulfate, chloride, magnesium fertilizers. Currently, there is no potassium production. So, supply of magnesium oxide to refractory brick producers and cement industries can also be you know, 
sort of from our indigenous production and play regarding the plate magnesium production. This is replacing the value of more and more kind of play retardants so we can utilize them and we can supply a good stock for magnesium metal products. So with this I will uh, you know, end my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, before moving before uh, forward, forward, may I request Hrithik, who is hosting this, uh, this event, uh, to kindly mute other speakers. speakers. Otherwise, my voice is echoing. Hrithik. Okay. Thank you very much for your, uh, for those uh, valuable insights, Dr. Kumar. We move on to our next speaker, Dr. Himanshu Shekhar Tripathi. Who is senior principal scientist and head refractory and ceramics division CSIR CGCRI? Dr. Himanshu uh, Shekhar Tripathi, senior principal uh, uh, senior principal scientist and head refractory and traditional ceramics division CSIR Central Glass and Research Cent uh, Ceramic Research Institute, uh, Fujia Center, graduated from the University of Calcutta in ceramic engineering and obtained his MTech and PhD technical degree from ceramic engineering from the same university. Dr. Tripathi has 25 years of research experience in different fields of ceramics. He has received many fellowships and awards like Refractory Technologist Award from Indian Ceramic Society, Bhansham Mishra Innovation Award from All India Pottery Manufacturers Association, etc. He has published more than 55 research papers in SCI journals, more than 35 papers in, con uh, in conference proceedings, and has six patents in his paper. Ready. Uh, may I invite Dr. Tripathi now? Dr. Tripathi, please. Okay, my, my slides is visible? Yes, sir. It is visible. Okay. And thank you all. Thank you all. And uh, first of all, I must thank uh, our uh, CSR CMCRI and the Indian Chamber of Commerce to uh, give me this opportunity to uh, share our works, some of our thoughts on particular in the magnesia, refractive magnesia. So, but, so I'll just uh, uh, come directly to the particularly from refractive point of view. If you see the refractive used in different industry, so the major user of the refractive is iron and steel. And particularly, I'm highlighting this blue mark with the magnesia containing this burn, tar impregnated magnesia, magnesia carbon, magnesium aluminate spinel, or direct, uh, direct chrome mac. This type of magnesia bearing refractory is used in iron and steel. And if you see the uh, percentage of uh, percentage of uh, refractory used in iron and steel is about 65 to 70 percent. And then the cement, and then non-ferrous, and some other glass and some other industries. So in glass industries also the magnesite brick is used. In cement industry, magnesite, magnesia chrome, magnesia aluminate spinel, also different type of magnesia. And copper industry also they use the magnesia dolomite, magnesia chrome, and magnesia aluminate spinel. So magnesia is used. And if you consider this the refractive, maybe the magnesia and alumina, it constitute about the 70% of the all the refractive products. So the magnesite is a uh, magnesia refractory and the, the raw material of the magnesite is an important material for the refractory industry. So this MGOC, uh, MGO based refractory, so it is unavoidable. So without the magnesia refractory steel cannot be produced in the LD. So it renders superior properties in basic environment of steel making process, particularly in the LD. And different, suppose magnesia carbon, aluminum magnesia carbon that is used in steel ladles, LD converter, magnesium aluminate, uh, magnesium aluminate spinel is uh, uh, used in a cement rotary kiln, steel ladle, tan disc, glass regenerator, and magnesia chrome. But the, what is the source of the magnesia? The, the major source of magnesia, the, sorry, the major source of magnesia is the, is the natural, Magnesite is rock, that is the rock, uh, the magnesite embedded in the deposit, that is the irregular belt, this is the magnesite, the magnesium carbonate, that the, now, occurs as a magnesium, uh, magnesium carbonate in the rock form. Then the second source is the seawater. So inland brine or seawater, it contains the magnesium uh, containing salt. And then marine byproducts involving carbonate, chloride, sulfates, and magnesium. But the major source is the natural magnesite. So if you see the natural occurrence of the magnesite, the world reserves about 7,600 million tons of magnesite is available. The, the resource is 7,600 million tons. And the major, major is the resource is there in the Russia, 
and in China and in India, we have a waste about only one one percent reserve fish there. And India does not have any good quality magnesite. If you see the this in the the global pictures, and most of the magnesites are currently imported. So this is actually the I have the data, but somehow I have not uh, updated these things in 2018-19. The imported value of different magnesite was 1073 crores. The total uh, total value. Now. India, we have a, we have uh, the reserve, uh, main um, uh, reserves is Uttarakhand, this is the Almoda region, and Tamil Nadu, it is about 25% and uh, small amount of in the Rajasthan. And we have the total reserves, it is 82 million tons, and these are the resources, they have uh, 312 million tons. But the two major is the Salem, if you see the uh, composition, this lime and silica, in Salem particularly the lime and silica, particularly the silica content is more, and in Almora, this lime and iron oxide content is more. So what happens if the Salem, if you heat treated this, because this the refractive will be used at much higher temperature, maybe at around 1650 to 1700 degrees centigrade. So when you heat this magnesite to get the magnesia, sintered magnesia, so it will form different type of low melting phase, if the, the melting point is there. So this is monticellite, maroinite, but if the lime silica ratio is more, then maybe the some high melting phase is formed dicalcium silicate, tricalcium silicate. But in Almoda region, it contains the iron oxide. You see the iron oxide and silica. So it forms, the, and with the lime, it forms a dicalcium ferrite, dicalcium, tetracalcium aluminum ferrite. They all, they have a low melting pen. Point. So due to this, the formation of these low melting points, the Indian magnesites are not suitable for high temperature application. And magnesite is mostly important. So I am giving you the some uh, some of the figures. This is amount of thousand in tons, in thousand tons. How much magnesite is imported? You, see, you can see this even each and every year, day by day, it is increasing. Except in 2020-21, this is the directly imported data from the government website. And sorry, this is not uh, the July, it is a total full financial year 21 22. And you see that the major sintered magnesium imports is from the China and then the Australia and some Turkey. But if you see the, if it is a few, because this aggregate we import in the forms of a uh, particular for effect industry, either it is a sintered, that is the dead bond, or fused. But fused magnesia mostly imported from the China, you see the blue one. So it is totally more or less totally imported from China. So the major supplier is the China, Australia, and Turkey. And the availability of magnesite from China and Turkey is some uncertain. So development of high quality magnesia grain from indigenous source is need of the hour. At CSR, CGCRI, we have carried out some of the work to improve the thermo thermomechanical properties. So we, we have taken different approaches so if it is an Indian magnesite. As I mentioned, if you can control the lime silica ratio, you can change their phase assemblage and to some extent you can improve their thermomechanical properties. Or just to remove the CO content or the <coughs> to convert the CO to a different high temperature compounds using some additives. Or remove the lime, uh, sorry, remove the silica iron, iron oxide from the component and if only the CO is there with the magnesium, it will not detect the high temperature property. So one thing is the phase modification by changing the lime silica ratio. Originally we have uh, selected some uh, uh, magnesite having the lime silica ratio 0.58. We changed to 1 to 2 the lime silica ratio by adjusting with some amount of calcium carbonate and so on. And Titania, in some cases, for major phase modification, we use some titania, monoclinic zirconia to form different phases to consume this uh, small amount of RNA, calcium oxide present in the lime. And then the finally, the purification of magnesite through arc fusion so that we can remove both the silica and iron oxide. I will, I will show you some of the data. I will not go uh, in details. So if it is a if it is a pure uh, magnesite, then you can see a lot of this monticellate phase is there. But if you if, if we can adjust the lime silica ratio, if the lime silica ratio is 2 1, so suppose this one, this uh, second one, so you can see the uh, hot MR, hot MR, when we sintered at 1650 degrees, there is, there is a quite increase in the strength. So whenever we are changing the lime silica ratio. And the same thing, the flexural strength also we, we can be improved, but that is but we cannot upgrade the we cannot improve the the MGO content without any beneficiation. Same thing, if we can uh, use some typical some additives to combine this uh, this CO this line so that it can form a high melting phases, then also we can improve the property. So I can give you this is the as received as received uh, magnesite and it's sintered at different temperature 1450, 1500, 15 degree centigrade. But if you use suppose 1%, 2%, 3% additives, uh, 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 additives, we can see the additives also can uh, can change the phase assemblage and. Uh,
Dr. Tripathi is... Uh... Yeah, I will finish. Yeah, just two minutes. So, enrichment of MGO from Indian magnesite, so purification uh, is removal is required. So, what is the magnesium beneficiation? So, fourth protection, bacterial leaching, magnesite, uh, magnetic separation, different commercially. They are not commercially viable. Still, it is not viable because it needs multiple steps to remove this. At CSRC, we, we have started some work. Arcus on the magnesite was carried out in presence of sub additives to, to purify the magnesia and then the fusion that, that also by the fusion technique that increase the grain size and by this way we can improve the um, MGO content. I am giving you some of the preliminary data. So originally it was 84.5 this is one uh, particular variety of uh, almora magnesite and then arc fusion arc melting and then we, we, we can, it can improve from 91 to this is about one or two trials and 92 percent uh, magnesia. So it needs further work. And so further investigation is needed to achieve the MGO content to 97 percent. So uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Kumar already uh, shared these things. So at CSR, uh, um, CMCRI, so uh, they send us two samples. So the one is 95 percent, 99 Of course, this is also the preliminary work. And we evaluate this to develop the aggregate. We make the uh, refractive uh, RUL block and uh, measure its uh, refractiveness under load. So it is it got about 1680, more than 1680, particularly for 99 percent. This one there may be because we we, we carried out one small a. So but but we are in a process. We'll do some joint collaborative work with CM, CSM CSRI so that they, they can they can extract the pure magnesia and using that magnesia we can develop the the refractive grade sintered or fused magnesite magnesia grains and then develop the uh, refractive not only the superior magnesia it is in the form of a magnesia carbon because we have that expertise and so in, I will just come to the summary. So Indian magnesite is not suitable for high temperature application and because of its higher improved content and good quality magnesite are mostly imported from the China, Turkey, European Union, Austria and sea water magnesia and import of magnesite is disrupted due to several reasons and uh, in enrichment of Indian natural magnesite through different processes urgently needed and preparation of commercially viable magnesia from seawater or inland brine in India is a solution to this national problem because there is a there is a improvement particularly the user is iron and steel by 2030-31 our targeted steel production was 300 million tons so the automatically the refractive consumption will increase and we have to self-sustain particularly uh, in the in the form of a refractive raw material then there is urgent need to uh, to do some r d work particularly in, on the magnesia so this is thank you thank you all the kind presence Thank you, Dr. Tripathi, for your valuable inputs. Now we move on to our next speaker, Dr. C. Naveen Kumar. Dr. C. Naveen Kumar is working as senior scientist in CSIR, CCRI. He has done BTEC in chemical and electrochemical engineering and PhD in chemistry from Missouri University of Science and Technology, specializing in nanostructured porous materials. His research focus is on recovery of metals from primary and secondary resources through electro hydro and pyrometallurgical uh, routes, graphite beneficiation from low grade graphite ores, etc. Also, he is focusing on electro metallurgy and preparation of nanoporous foams. He is a recipient of prestigious CSIR Young Scientist Award from the year, uh, for the year 2018 in chemical sciences. Dr. Navin Kumar, please. Uh, <clears throat> respected uh, Chief Guest, uh, uh, Director CSM CRI, uh, I first of all thanks uh, thank every uh, the uh, committee members and uh, <clears throat> and the uh, committee for uh, giving me an opportunity to present uh, the ongoing and the past activities of uh, magnesium uh, magnesium extraction through molten salt electrolysis at uh, CSAR Sipri. Uh, are my slides visible, sir? Yes, sir, it is visible. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, magnesium needs no introduction because magnesium is be, uh, being a lightweight uh, metal than aluminum. It is being uh, considered as an alternate material for aluminum uh, for uh, uh, various uh, construction uh, applications. And also, in the, when it comes to energy, it is being considered as one of the uh, uh, finest electrode materials in seawater act uh, sea water activated batteries and many other uh, uh, energy storage uh, applications due to its uh, reactivity. So, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Kumar has already told how, uh, uh, I mean, uh, why magnesium is, uh, how uh, uh, the, the need for magnesium. 
so in the year uh, 2021, India has imported almost uh, 85.62 uh, USD million of uh, magnesium. Uh, so we rely mostly on uh, other countries, especially on China. So uh, it is uh, the uh, it, it is uh, imperative at this point to uh, uh, do. I mean, I mean uh, have. Uh, uh, hundred percent import substitution for this particular uh, for, for for this particular product, so that's why uh, uh, we, uh, that's why we, we are uh, uh, it's a very uh, mandatory to uh, do the magnesium uh, uh, production from uh, uh, from the primary and secondary sources. So uh, at uh, by 1970, uh, 1978, magnesium electrolysis was done at CSIS agree with uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, DMRL. Uh, uh, so there were uh, plants set up at uh, DMR land at the CSIS Cree. Uh, so the electronic cell was operated at 1000 to 1500 amps capacity and magnesium was produced at a scale of 12 to 20 kg per day. So uh, these are the uh, details of uh, the uh, CSI, the plant which was set up in CSI Sikri and DMRL. So the capacity of uh, say, in the, uh, the magnesium plant the set up at CSI Sikri was uh, 7.5 ton, uh, ton per year. Uh, the current efficiency uh, uh, it was between uh, 50 to 60 percentage and the chemical extraction efficiency i mean from the uh, uh, from the molten salt was uh, around uh, greater than 85 percentage the purity of the metal it was uh, between 98 to 99 percentage like, uh, the only thing is the power consumption was the difference between the uh, uh, cell operated at uh, uh, sikri and dmrl and uh, the, uh, uh, Engineers India Limited, uh, 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 develop, I mean, in collaboration with DMRL and CSI Sikri, they have developed an engineering design for uh, this magnesium electrolysis, and we'll still, we still we still have the data uh, for that particular uh, for the for, for with the complete uh, material and energy balance. And uh, uh, at nine, by 1978, uh, the operational ex capital expenses for producing uh, 900 tons per year plant was estimated to be 25 and 322 lakhs respectively. So the raw material consumption versus the output of magnesium. Uh, so the starting material is uh, starting material is basically uh, magnesium uh, chloride, and from uh, uh, 196 tons of magnesium chloride, we could produce uh, almost 25 tons of uh, the uh, magnesium uh, metal. So <clears throat> at present, uh, we the uh, we uh, CSA has uh, a very small uh, demo uh, setup where we can extract magnesium and calcium at a capacity of 1 kg per day and uh, we can uh, whatever the source may be i mean uh, uh, it can be a magnesium carb uh, uh, carbonate uh, uh, c bitten or uh, um, and also we are working uh, and also we have uh, we are working with united phosphorus limited where we recover the magnesium chloride from the spent grignard reagent liquor and then we use that as a source for production of uh, this magnesium uh, with the purity of 98.2 percentage so the chemistry is well known i mean uh, we just do electrolysis with uh, with a uh, with a suitable melt uh, the melt is to reduce the uh, i mean i mean the uh, uh, low, uh, lower the temperature uh, melting point of uh, the magnesium chloride and uh, we use uh, sodium chloride uh, kcl and mgcl2 as the feed and the cell is operated at uh, 700 to 750 degrees c and we apply voltage, which uh, 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 which basically disassociates magnesium chloride to magnesium at the uh, uh, cathode and chloride uh, on the on the on, on chlorine at the uh, at the anode. So the advantages of the pro process, uh, if the electric if if the source of electrons uh, if the source of electricity is cheap, definitely the process cost is low, and the uh, and the uh, one more bottle uh, uh, and uh, then the process would be commercially viable. Uh, uh, come, uh, come, come economically viable and the byproduct chlorine uh, can be used for the production of uh, hypochlorite and the bottleneck over here is we should have a very good engineering I mean cell design which could uh, separate the uh, products uh, both the cathode and anode, uh, anode products so that like you know the, 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 the recombination of the magnesium and chlorine would not happen which were, which were, which will have uh, which will have a drastic effect on the uh, product uh, recovery uh, 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 recovery of uh, and uh, which affects the cell efficiency also uh, so this this is a setup uh, which uh, uh, which we had before i mean uh, for both calcium and uh, magnesium and of course uh, 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 calcium um, in the case of calcium uh, we produce almost 800 kg of calcium and uh, provided to bark uh, barc for uh, uh, production of uh, this uh, reduction of this uh, 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 rare metals so uh, here uh, in the in this in this setup uh, we have uh, an, um, a carbon as the anode 
and carbon won't get consumed as CO2, but it gets disintegrated over time. Uh, so and uh, uh, and uh, uh, mild steel as the uh, mild steel as the cathode. So uh, we have demonstrated to various industries. I mean, uh, the uh, very. I mean, we demonstrated to Tata Chemicals. We demonstrated the setup to uh, Tata Steels, uh, where, and uh, we demonstrated to uh, United Phosphorus Limited recently, uh, where we could uh, get 98.2 percent pure magnesium from the uh, secondary source which they have provided, and uh, we are expecting a project from Tata Steels uh, for from the. Uh, I mean, uh, from the ferro ferrochrome slag, we, uh, they they need to extract the magnesium which is available there in the form of magnesium chloride, and then convert it to and then convert it to uh, magnesium. So uh, the way forward is uh, uh, so. <clears throat> uh, so uh, we are also working with uh, high energy batteries for production of uh, magne uh, magnesium alloy anodes for seawater batteries. So uh, the idea is to scale 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 the process up to 10 kg per day with the data available uh, from both the prime from both the from the extraction of uh, magnesium from both primary and secondary sources. So right now uh, we uh, we we rely on uh, United Phosphorus Limited and Tata, Tata Steels for the uh, funding. Uh, so with this, I would like to thank uh, uh, everyone for this opportunity given. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, your inputs. Now, next speaker for the day is Mr. Bharat Rawal. Mr. Bharat Rawal is Vice President, Unit Head, Grassim Industries Limited, and President of the Indian Salt Manufacturers Association. Mr. Bharat uh, Rawal had started his career as a salt inspector for Government of India. Thereafter, served for five years with NDDB in cooperative field at the little run of Kutch and worked for poor agarias for their social economic development. Presently, he is with Grassim Industries Limited, Chemical Division, a flagship company of Aditya Builder Group uh, since May 2013 as the Vice President and Unit Head. He is also the President of the Indian Salt Manufacturers Association and the Kutch Saurashtra Salt Manufacturers Association since 2015. Mr. Rawal, please. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Mr. Rawal. Yeah. yeah. Good morning. I am audible, sir. Yeah. I yeah. Am audible, sir. Yeah. You are yeah. audible, sir. First of all, I would. Yeah. First of all, I would like to thankful to the ICC, Dr. Rajiv Singh, and uh, even the. I thankful to Mr. Satender Singh, who is there to watch this conference uh, from the government side and all the doctors from the CSIR. From industry side, why not? It is. Just wait. I'm. Is, sir, it is difficult to share. Why? Uh, no, sir. Others have just shared their uh, presentation. No, what others have, but I uh, have a... What happened your question, why? sir? Just as, uh, it is a connecting, showing the connecting, but not uh, appear from this uh, my uh, screen mode. Screen sharing is not allowing either, or it is under process. Just showing. Uh, Rithik, uh, can you help uh, sir out with this? I, can I can I try from uh, my another device? Yes, sir. Uh, meanwhile, maybe uh, request uh, Mr. Khan. You know, Mr. to Khan. Khan, yes. Khan, and maybe Khan, after yes, him, yes. you know, you can come in and you know. Yes. 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 Sir. yes, 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 yes. Okay, sure. So, uh, may I request Mr. N. H. Khan now, DGM Process Development Tata Chemicals, to uh, deliver his his address. Uh, Shri Najmul Hassan Khan has done masters in chemical engineering from IIT Madras. He has worked in project management, process engineering, technical services, and production for around 33 years in chemical process industries. 
His area of expertise is process engineering. His experience includes conceptualizing, scale up, design, engineering, and implementation of projects and uh, process industrial lines of bulk drugs, pharmaceutical intermediaries, and polymers and bulk chemicals. Mr. N. H. Khan, please. Hello, good morning to all. Uh, I am Najmul Khan uh, from Tata Chemicals, Mithapur. I will be sharing our experience with uh, Potash. Uh, my slides are visible. Yes, sir, visible. So I am uh, thankful to ICC to give us the opportunity to present our experience with the Potash. Uh, these are the it's contents. Slide show, Najmul. Make it slide show. Hello. Make it a slide show. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so our, our content of the presentations are uh, presentation is uh, shown here. Uh, first uh, about Tata Group. Uh, Tata Group is the India's largest business group with uh, over 100 companies uh, operating in seven business sectors, uh, operations in over 80 countries products and services in over uh, 85 countries over 456000 employees are working with uh, tata group and group turnover is over 100 billion dollars 58% of the revenue is coming from india uh so tata chemicals tata chemicals is located at the westernmost tip of uh, gujarat uh, in devbhum dwarka district it is surrounded uh, by sea from three sides. Uh, sunlight is available throughout the year. Uh, rainfall is scanty. It is uh, generally 15 to 16 inches uh, on an average per year. Wind speed is high throughout the year. Uh, land is arid, dry and impervious. Uh, our products are uh, mainly soda ash, uh, caustic soda, sodium bicarbonate, clinker, cement, liquid bromine, uh, iodized vacuum salt and solar salt. Uh, solar salt production for the last five years are given here. It is uh, ranging from 23 lakhs to 30 lakhs. Actually, uh, bittern generation is uh, around one ton, uh, one kiloliter per ton of solar salt. So our bitter generation is also around 30 lakh kiloliter per annum. Uh, bitter coming out after the salt harvesting is at around 29 bomi and uh, it contains potash uh, uh, concentration of about uh, 21 grams per liter. That uh, this is in the form of potassium chloride. Uh, the potassium chloride start uh, precipitating at very high concentration uh, like at around 36 bomi it becomes saturated and starts crystallizing so uh, from uh, we have to concentrate the bittern from 29 bomi to 36 bomi and it is coming out uh, uh, along with sodium chloride magnesium sulfate and uh, small uh, quantity of magnesium chloride. So basically it is called uh, mixed salt and it is containing um, potassium chloride, sodium chloride, magnesium sulfate and magnesium chloride. Uh, for the uh, sulfate of potash uh, pilot plant we collaborated with uh, CSMCRI, CSIR uh, DST, NMCC, Fertilizer Association of India, Ministry of Chemical, uh, Chemicals and Fertilizer. Our uh, technology partners were uh, CSMCRI and uh, Tata Consulting Engineers. So this is the uh, concentration of bitten, how it is getting concentrated and what are the products like. So uh, from 29 BOMI, we concentrate it to 32 BOMI, uh, we get crude salt and then uh, up to 36 BOMI, we get cells mixed salt and uh, from 36 BOMI to 38 BOMI, whatever is crystallizing, it is mixed salt. 
the composition of uh, the uh, starting material that is bitterned is given here. Here, potash is around 1.6 to 1.8 uh, percent weight by weight. In mixed salt, uh, potassium chloride is around 18 to 22 percent. And uh, specification or, uh, of uh, sulfate of potash is uh, K2O more than 50 percent. Sulfur is more than 17.5 percent and chloride is less than 2.5 percent. This is the uh, process flow diagram. Actually, we uh, harvest kenite type mixed salt from the uh, salt works and then it is decomposed using uh, seawater. Uh, centrifuge, we get uh, shonite uh, and the mother liquor is containing a lot of potassium chloride which is uh, desulfated, uh, concentrated and then crystallized and recycled back into the next step of the process. So, uh, with uh, shonite, it reacts and forms sulphate of potash. The, uh, the mother liquor coming out from the uh, uh, potassium chloride recovery process is, con uh, is containing a lot of uh, magnesium chloride, which is uh, of good quality. So, it is uh, used for producing uh, magnesium oxide using lime uh, to convert magnesium chloride into magnesium hydroxide and it is filtered and uh, then calcined. Uh, we were uh, able to establish the uh, process, validate the technology and uh, actually we produce good quality of uh, sulphate of potash. The results are shown here. Actually, K2O was 52.85 percent, sulfur 17.99 uh, percent, and chloride was 0.7 uh, percent. So, technology was validated. We uh, sent 50 kg of uh, uh, material to Junagadh University for uh, taking field trial. Uh, so, we got the result also, it is shown in the next uh, uh, slide. But SOP produced through this route uh, was more expensive than the imported MOP. So, it, it is uh, really not a substitute for MOP. And uh, with Indian exports of fruits and vegetables increasing particularly to EU, cheaper SOP can help farmers to switch over to SOP. So, we need to work on this. So, uh, this is the uh, uh, efficacy trial results and uh, as uh, reported by Junagadh University by using a sulphate of potash in uh, groundnut uh, crop, actually its yield increased up to uh, 25 percent. So, while uh, working on the sulphate of potash, uh, we encountered a number of challenges. Uh, uh, which are uh, given here. So, the, there are some problems encountered and then what we did to uh, come out of this problem. Uh, first one was uh, percolation losses at high concentration of bittern. So, actually when, when we concentrate bittern from 29 BOMI to say 36-38 BOMI, uh, percolation losses become significant. Uh, and uh, evaporation decreases at high concentration. So, what we did, we provided in, impervious HDP liners in the uh, salt works so that uh, we can reduce the percolation losses. And uh, due to low evaporation, actually, uh, we, uh, I mean, uh, kept this uh, bitten in large area so that evaporation can take place. And then uh, along with the uh, kenite type mix all, a lot of uh, mud, clay, etc. was coming, which was affecting the uh, process. Uh, so, we, what we did, we actually uh, dissolved the kenite type mix salt and uh, clarified it using a flocculating agent, etc. Uh, and we did it in two steps. So, first we dissolved and uh, clarified it and then in second step we added uh, remaining quantity of KTMS to form the uh, next uh, product like uh, uh, that is Shonite. 
then recovery uh, and recycle of uh, kcl that is uh, merit of potash actually uh, we change the process from uh, bias to continuous so it, the mother liquor coming out from the first step was uh, processed uh, kcl recovered and recycled back into the uh, next step of sulfate of potash process Then we encountered uh, the slurry filtration problem due to uh, low solid concentration. So we installed decanter to concentrate the slurry so that it can be uh, filtered with pusher centrifuge. Then uh, actually while uh, working on this, uh, uh, we got a higher concentration of uh, sodium chloride in uh, potassium chloride. So we introduced one uh, step that is of uh, cold leaching to remove sodium chloride from uh, mirrored of potash and then it was recycled back. <clears throat> then uh, availability of uh, raw material that is uh, kinite type mixer because as we discussed earlier uh, it is uh, getting crystallized above 36 bomi. So uh, uh, I mean, time period available to produce Kinetic type mix salt is very small because once we uh, start harvesting solar salt, then we generate bitern which is of 29 bomi. So from 29 bomi to 36 or 38 bomi, uh, time period available is not much, and uh, it has to be uh, to be done before monsoon. So actually, we were able to produce around uh, 700 tons of kinetic type mix salt. We source around 100 tons material from CS and CRI. Actually, we also produced uh, procured around 800 tons material from Kutch, but it was not of good quality. So, so at uh, uh, when we concentrate uh, bitter from 29 to 38 bomi, I, because of higher concentration, the evaporation is very slow, and percolation losses become significant. So, this was uh, one major problem. And uh, sourcing good quality of mixed salt is also difficult because the mixed salt is not produced commercially. So in conclusion, actually, uh, it is difficult to uh, produce kinetic type mixed salt uh, for a commercial recovery of potash due to moderate temperature and high humidity in and around uh, Mithapur region. Kutch region with high evaporation rates could be a better suited uh, area for kinetic type mix salt uh, crystallization. Uh, a cost efficient process should be uh, developed for the recovery of uh, potash. So actually we need to work on this uh, further to make it a commercially feasible venture. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Uh, Mr. Rawal, are you ready with your uh, uh, presentation? Yes, uh, your presentation is visible, uh, Mr. Rawal. But you are not audible. Mr. Rawal, can you hear me? Uh, now audible? Yeah, now audible and your uh, slides are also visible, but you know, if you can just change it to slide mode. Yeah, slide mode, yes. Yeah. Okay. Fine, okay, sir. Yeah, yeah, fine. Sorry for uh, this uh, trouble and I have uh, again joined from, through WebEx. So that is why that little bit take a time. Thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rajiv and uh, other doctors from CSIR. Basically, from the salt industry side, uh, the presentation is covering about our uh, practical issues for the, the recovery of the uh, all the byproduct or value added product. As uh, we are having a particular myself uh, from the two, uh, 1999 to 2009, we have a setup uh, 
the biggest means largest capacity of bromine plant in greater run of Kutch from the Thapar group. So we are having a practical experience for this uh, recovery of the byproduct. So my presentation, I would like to uh, in this written valorization and issues. See, basically, uh, as uh, my friend uh, uh, Mr. Khan already uh, covered, but this is practical matter is that when theoretically the sea brine required for one ton of uh, salt around a 55 meter cube, whereas our experience is telling that we need minimum 85 uh, meter cube of the seawater having 3.5 degree BOMI to produce uh, one ton of salt. So here the mass balance I have put up uh, uh, first by product is a gypsum. Main product is a salt and thereafter bitten. Bitten we are uh, we are producing equivalent volume of the salt. Whereas the major crude salt and mixed salts are the material which is important for our uh, byproduct. This is the flow chart for after the bitten. Uh, crude salt, sales mix, and all these things almost covered by the te by technical uh, other friends. Hmm. Ah, now focusing on this in India, as on today, we are producing 30 million ton of salt, 300 lakhs metric ton of salt. And considering that mass volume, our capacity, if we look at the uh, major product bromine and potas, then 45,000 metric ton bromine can be produced and uh, 1,50,000 ton around potas is being produced. As on date, major player in the greater run of Kutch is a uh, archain chemical, whereas in bromine, there are four major players, including uh, Tata Chemicals. Uh, as on today, Agrocell and Solaris, both are the same. So their capacity touch is uh, almost 50% of the capacity of Indian bromine production. Here the issue is the bitten discharge. The basic issue with our Indian salt industry is size. Any byproduct or any recovery uh, recovery of the any byproduct from the sea or sea salt uh, required minimum capacity of two lakhs ton of salt per annum. That will be viable basically because of otherwise the viability is the question so bitten discharge so so many salt manufacturers are uh, not even as per the moef is concerned right now no no one units is discharging bitten in the sea but they are recirculating and facing the issue of the calcium higher the calcium within the salt field also but anyhow the people are managing to produce good quality of the salt Availability of the surplus land. Land is the biggest issue and the matter is, I can give you the example. When Archen started their project in 2002, uh, application uh, uh, for the land, and they they commercially started production around uh, within a 2012 or 13. So these 12 to 13 years long span to set up a large uh, project having a huge uh, investment, it is an interest loss purely. So in that case, land matter from the ISMA also, we always recommended government that uh, we should have a, introduce a land bank for the saline land bank to utilize majorly for the salt and marine uh, fisheries industries. Better communication and coordination, salt unit, no doubt, CSMCRI, we at ISMA, the CSMCRI is the special permanent invitees for our uh, institute, whereas we always uh, getting uh, remarkable and useful tips from the CSMCRI's officials, mainly Dr. Arvind uh, and uh, Dr. Kanan. But we can commercialize it, we can introduce uh, further uh, communication close communication to encourage the people to set a to set up a, for this byproduct additional revenue generation is no doubt about it as on date the salt market is go up and the, all the byproduct earlier in 2000 or uh, 90s the bromine production against the price if we consider the market price 
the market price was almost cost of production and market price was the same. But nowadays, days are changed. There is a value of the bromine and there is a demand of the bromine. So uh, bright future for the recovery of the uh, byproducts, mainly bromine and potas. Modernization and mechanization during last 20 years in Gujarat, almost uh, laborers are hardly 30%. We are having a uh, harvesting process through the labor. Otherwise, most of the people switch over to the uh, mechanization. So it will be a boost factor to produce more salt and to produce more bitter. For an extent, no doubt about it, when we are going to produce this uh, potas and uh, as per the, our uh, national slogan, Atma Nirbhar, definitely it will be value added things. Generation of additional employment and opportunity in recovery of the potas. As we know, pre-earthquake, what was the Kutch? And as on today, now the Kutch having uh, different, uh, totally different, 360 degree. They are, they are providing a lot of employment, very good uh, infrastructure over there, including major port. Kandla is also developing uh, year by year. So uh, there is a bright future, no doubt about it, when greater runoff cuts and distance logistically, it is a hardly 110 kilometers from the connecting uh, logistics. Generation of economic activity and creating employment. Employment, definitely, there are in salt industry around 12,000 number of units, and we are providing direct, indirect employment around 2.5 lakhs of the uh, people. Upgradation of the technology in salt industry, which is most of 40 to 50 percent salt units are now uh, switch on over the modernization, mechanization, but small scale. What I initially I, 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 I was inform you that uh, the size of the salt unit is the bottleneck in our country because of the small scales are around 11,000 uh, plus, whereas hardly sizable unit, MSME, or we can say the uh, organized unit, hardly in number of 50. So that is the issue with us. So we have to think on that, how we can merge those unit in the cooperative sector and small scale sectors to uh, mainly towards the uh, recovery of the byproduct. Potas, no doubt about it. Potas is a very important material and uh, we are the agricultural uh, nation. Our NPK demands goes year by year up and salt industry can help in this area with the support of the CSMCRI uh, for establish more plant in near future. So thanks from the Indian Salt Manufacturer Association. From the industry side, uh, may I request a uh, government official who is present over here uh, from this, uh, we are having a fear when the central government is going to closer, closer of the salt department, we, we have to think about it. When only the monitoring agency for the salt industry in India and as per the article 58, it is a central subject and only four states are producing salt whereas others are consuming the salt. It is, it is a crucial to continue the salt department with the active participations, mainly technical side, as well as the distribution uh, channel side. So thank you, thank you very much for this, to give me opportunity for this presentation. Thank you, Mr. Raval. I will quickly move on, move on to our next speaker, Mr. Bishwajit Ghosh, who is Associate Vice President Technology, uh, Krosaki Refractories Limited. Mr. Bishwajit Ghosh is MTech in Material Science uh, uh, Material Science and Engineering from IIT Kanpur. He has done his B.Tech in Ceramics from Government College of Ceramics uh, Technology, Calcutta. He has more than 29 years of experience in product development, technology establishment, application and design of refractories, at TRL Krosaki Refractories. He has published more than four, uh, 40 technical papers in various national and international seminars, journals, and receives 
received best paper award in ncbms 2018 mr bishwajit ghosh and would request uh, him to uh, stick to the stipulated time sir thank you thank you mr dev for giving me this opportunity for to present this paper and i also thank to the mr satender singh government of india's representative and also the all the industry colleagues present in this uh, conferences so i just share my presentation is it visible no mr ghosh it is not visible So meanwhile, you are trying. Maybe request uh, our next speaker. Yeah, yeah. Now it is visible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, I will be speaking on the challenges of uh, uh, refractories industry, particularly for the magnesia containing. Where already from the CSR laboratory, Dr. Tripathi has explained a little bit about this uh, topic. So the the brief introduction about the what is the magnesia. is application in the various target areas and various grades of magnesia what are available across the globe and what are the sources and drawbacks particularly for the indian sources and how to uh, counter these measures by the research and development and also the industrial research to remove this uh, beneficiation process and this magnesia as you know india is refractory market is currently the second largest in the world market and it is very fastest growing in the world by global refractory players today uh, if you see the india refractory uh, makers association we have a capacity of 1.5 million tons per annum and the indian market is around 9700 crores around 9700 crores indian refractory market and it is highly dependent on the imported raw material and uh, as you know the china being the major raw material suppliers in the globe and its strict environmental policies taxation policies are going indirectly impacting the industrial operations in india particularly where we are importing huge quantity of mgo from this uh, chinese origin and in the leading refractories manufacturer in india trl prosaki from which uh, organization i belong to it is the largest refractories company in the india and formally it was known as tata refractories limited now with the collaboration of the kurosaki harima corporation japan it has been renamed as trl kurosaki refractories followed by rhi magnesita uh, then followed by imidis calderis then also uh, dalmia ocl ifgl refractories and also visubius refractories these are the re major refractory players accounting more than 70% market share today in the india and others are all the small sectors they are catering the indian refractory market but with the projection of the steel growth 130 million ton and uh, in coming 2030 by 300 million ton steel production refractory market is are growing significantly and as you know the iron and steel sectors are accounting 70% of the uh, production of the refractories and refractory consumption is 12 kg per capita of the steel and 4.5 kg for cement and 1.7 kg for the aluminium in the left hand side the india refractory market 70% is accounting by the steel sectors followed by the 12% by the cement non ferrous sector copper zinc lead alloys glass industry 3% and others 9% and as i have mentioned by 300 million ton it is a ambitious growth plan by the government of steel and also the other steel manufacturers tata steel jsw group it is very ambitious growth plan which they have marked and which is connected to the refractories industry and cement uh, cement industry is also augmenting it has production capacity by 550 million ton currently they are producing 360 million ton roughly and indian crude production in the right hand side already it is given in 2020 it is around expected 120 million ton we have already produced and uh, by this 2025 26 we have a plan of refractories market will be growing 
at the rate of 5% of the total global market and will be touching around 12,000 crore Indian refractory market. The major refractory raw material, as you know, magnesia containing around 26% and other seafood refractories, great clay, then uh, calcine bauxite, brown fused alumina, dolomite. This is in the total pie. If you see, the 26% of the magnesia is being consumed by the refractive producer for the steel manufacturing and non ferrous sector. So this is the most important area what we are catering to the refractories market. And if you see the total refractories, this MGO application, application was the refractory market is our, uh, application was around 52% of the MGO is used in the refractory market, followed by the chemical industry around 18, 18% chemical industry, paper industry, and where the caustic calcium magnesite chemical process of wood pulping as a raw material, magnesium sulfide production, and pulp industry, cellulose protector, all these things are used in the chemical industry. Agriculture industry, magnesium element containing in the magnesium oxide is required for the plant photosynthesis and as a nutrient contributing to the animal health. And caustic calcium magnesium is also used for the magnesium for ruminal nutrition, also here used for the sheep and poultry. And also is the various fertilizer application, especially for the crops, such as citrus fruits, potatoes, vegetables, and grass pastures. All these things are also used in the agriculture industry. And in the environmental sectors, uh, soil and groundwater treatment, waste treatment, drinking water treatment, and magnesia is a, having a capacity to stabilizing the dissolved heavy metals. So these are the applications. But uh, why, what is the beauty of the magnesia? For the refractory, it has a excellent corrosion resistance when it is coming into the highly corrosive basic slab, particularly the high calcium oxide around 45 to 50 percent, SiO2 around 25 to 30 percent, and alumina containing slag. This highly corrosious, corrosive slag is encountered in the basic oxygen furnace, steel melting, ladle, ladle refining processes, where MD, MD, MGO crane offers this excellent corrosion resistance towards this slag particularly the low silica content, high bulk density, good hot modulus of rupture, and refractiveness under load, high pyrometric cone equivalent, that is fusion point and abrasion region. So these are the beauty of the magnesia, uh, which offers its excellent behavior into the refractories aggregate. And as I have already explained, the refractories, particularly magnesia is in combination with the graphite, chromia, Alumina are added to different magnesia refractories. Magnesia carbon refractories are predominantly used in the basic oxygen furnace in the steel ladle, like steel ladle converter, steel ladle um, slag line areas, and also electric arc furnace. So magnesia carbon uh, is, all, is a prominent material is being used by the steel industry. Direct bonded magnesia chrome bricks in combination of the chrome this magnesia direct bonding at high temperature, ultra high temperature firing, 1750 to 1800 degrees centigrade. It is being used in the non ferrous sectors in the copper industry, zinc industry, lead industry, where various co copper concentrates are produced from the 60% purity level to 99% purity, where magnesia chrome offers excellent corrosion resistance towards this phyletic slag being produced in the copper for producing unit and zinc industry, isha smelter, PS converter, all this area. Apart from this, magnesia spinel and magnesia refractories are also used for the cement industry, electric arc furnace, backup lining. So these are the host magnesia application is find as a, a utility. And if you see already it has been presented, the all the total reserve, the worldwide reserve yeah, is more 8,500 million ton reserve is there, and Russia and Korea accounts for 54% of the world deposit. But though China is uh, deposit is around 23-12%, but the world total market is being catered by these Chinese players. Major producer of magnesium in China, 49% with 12% reserves only, and other major producers are Russia and Turkey, and rest, but India is very, uh, not good quality deposits are available across the Indian or uh, geographical position, what has been explained by Dr. Tripathi in the Almora and Salem region, which is accounting high SiO2 content and high Fe2O3 content, which is very detrimental for high temperature application. Natural magnesite is plentifully available and key source of the production of magnesium oxide. It is 
the plane lived present as a naturally occurring in Austria, in which up to 8%, and brucite, magnesium hydroxide, also available in the uh, nature. Then natural magnesite, then seawater. Seawater contains uh, MgO uh, chloride, magnesium chloride, hydroxide, which is prepared from the seawater. Then I will be discussing in detail about the seawater. The various industrial grades of magnesia, calcite, magnesia. Sir, sorry to, sir, uh, sorry to intervene, but we have one more speaker and we have possibility yeah, of just, time. Uh, you can just, sorry, you know, wind up as soon yeah, as possible. Just, I, I'm just going through. So these Thank are you. the, uh, yeah, calcite, magnesia, I'm not going details. So these are the production route of the seawater with calcium, magnesium, chloride, and all this precipitation is done, detailed presentation. So dead burn magnesia is uh, calcined at more than 2000 degrees centigrade to liberate its carbon dioxide and dead burn, it is more volume stable. And fused magnesia is one of the most prominent material and more than 2750 degrees it's uh, electrical arc furnace it is fused and more than 1000 micron so these are the various grades of magnesia available as you know the crystal size is increases its corrosion resistance is also increasing so these are the low temperature forms which is uh, attributable monticellite is a low temperature application which is present in the indian magnesite and it is uh, restricting to the use and these are the foreign indian source versus foreign source foreign source you see the mgo purity is very high 97.3 and bulk density is 3.4 3.5 range and uh, these are the turkish region came to a and 97 hd from the indian uh, this the, the almora magnesite and uh, all the salem magnesite is high impurities sio2 and uh, calcium oxide it is restricting so there has been already de deliberation from the csr laboratory they have done a lot of research work and it is under continuation and indian magnesite and other development purification is not so much successful commercially and properties of the magnesium aggregates produced by the plasma fusion and addition of zirconia is under completion studies of densification mechanical structure all these are in progress and densification properties of rich magnesium aluminate spinel derived from the natural is in progress. So these developments were made with the Indian magnesite to utilize the source and cost effectiveness in very, very precise manner. These developments will enhance the refractive properties positively. But uh, with the growth of the Indian steel plants, there has been a global magnesium oxide market uh, is growing at a rate of 4% CAGR due to the steady demand from the iron and steel sectors and resurgence of this construction industry, which result additional demand in the cement and construction. So there is a heavy demand in the magnesia and we are primarily dependent on the Chinese origin and uh, large extent present challenges. Uh, the India is the dearth of good quality material and still not able to develop the high purity material from the Indian magnesite sources. So research institute doing continuous work to develop the high quality magnesite raw material which will be commercially viable. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ghosh. And I apologize, you know, due to paucity of time, yeah. uh, we could not go through the entire pre presentation of yours. Yeah. But thank I would you. request you if you can uh, share us, uh, share with us your presentation, maybe we can, you know, then circulate it amongst the, the other speakers. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, thank we move on to our uh, last speaker for the day, Dr. Uh, Chaganti RVS Nagesh, who is scientist G and head titanium and magnesium group DMRL DRDO. Dr. Nagesh has been working in the field of extraction metallurgy of titanium, magnesium and tungsten. He obtained PhD in metallurgical engineering and metallurgical, uh, met metallurgical science from Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay in the year 2000. As project director, successfully handled sem several metallurgical projects like development and demonstration of technology for titanium sponge production, tungsten metal extraction and recyc uh, recycling technologies, etc. He, uh, he has one Indian patent and 60 technical papers, presentations, book chapters. He is recipient of uh, awards like DRDO Laboratory Scientist of the Year, DMRL Technology Group Award, etc. May I now request Mr. Nagesh to take yeah, over, please. Thank you very much. I am thankful to organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to share with uh, you the recent developmental works on magnesium metal production by fused salt electrolysis of anhydrous MgCl2. I hope I am uh, audible and my slides are visible. Very much so, sir. Yeah. The contents of my presentation is uh, developmental works carried out on fused salt electrolysis of anhydrous MgCl2 to produce magnesium metal on pilot scale at DMRL. 
and currently two uh, establishment of two magnesium pilot projects with the support of DAE and ISRO is taking place. This presentation also covers uh, recently started a basic research to produce anhydrous MgCl2 from seawater bitterns because we will be requiring more MgCl2 than the output of sponge production for meeting the magnesium requirement. So our interest, DMRL interest in uh, the development of fused salt electrolysis technology is derived basically to fill the gaps in the titanium sponge production flow sheet. Titanium sponge is produced by the crawl process of magnesium reduction of titanium tetrachloride in which magnesium chloride anhydrous MgCl2 is reaction byproduct. And unless this byproduct is uh, recycled by fused salt electrolysis to regenerate magnesium metal and chlorine, the economics of titanium sponge production will be largely impaired and uh, unless this fused, uh, this MgCl2 is not recycled we have a major problem of solid waste disposal because of these important parameters DMRL parallelly developed fused salt electrolysis technology for magnesium recovery from magnesium chloride in the fused salt electrolysis magnesium chloride is it is not a recent one it is very old practice and uh, there are many countries mastered in the technology and However, the technology is not shared usually and uh, every manufacturer usually develops uh, homegrown technology for implementation for commercial production. Uh, thus, India also started the basic research way back in the uh, 70s at Sikri and based on some uh, technical inputs from Sikri, DMRL started the developmental works on the fused salt electrolysis technology. See, mainly the DMRL technology development uh, is of two parts. In the first phase, we have considered the monopolar cell technology with the technical inputs from Dr. Desikan from CECRI. Then uh, that was uh, uh, scaled up to a 30 kA cell, which was largely operated for quite amount of some time, wherein to the focus was on to understand the electrolysis parameters and uh, study the very influence of various uh, uh, parameters like salt composition, the addition scheme, bath temperature, and so on, current densities, and so on, to make an insight into the electrolysis technology. And that went on for quite some time, resulting in about uh, 27 tons of magnesium produced. However, subsequently, there are parallel developments elsewhere in the world. The multipolar cell technology has come into vogue because of its several advantages and the next phase of development, DMRL focused on design and development of various types of multipolar cells to, to demonstrate the magnesium chloride recycling technology. Basically, the multi, in the multipolar cell, there will be one central anode and two end cathodes in which bipoles, a set of bipoles are kept and electrolysis is conducted taking a, typical bath of NaCl, KCl, which dissolves up to 20% of MgCl2. Either solid or liquid MgCl2 can be fed into the cell. However, the solid feeding is old technology and currently molten MgCl2 feeding has a lot of advantages with respect to the cell performance. So, though the principle is apply DC voltage and you get magnesium at cathode and chlorine at anode, the technology is much more complicated because it uh, has several parameters for consideration, selection of refractory, magnesium metal as it flows on the electrolyte, how it can be collected to non-electrolytic zone, and leak tightness of the cell. Major enemy is sludge formation in electrolysis, how to minimize sludge formation. These are all the, to, how to avoid recombination of metal and chlorine. These are all the technological parameters that have to be established before the process is taken up for regular production. So the DMRL focus was on that. Different types of multipolar cells have been designed, put into operation for as part of the technology development program. Typically, I wanted to present here the 7K multipolar cell, first of its kind in the country, which is a basically a rectangular steel cell in which refractories are laid to hold molten salt and a set of uh, bipoles placed on either side of central anode. Central anode is graphite. On either side, there is a steel cathode kept, which are connected to DC power source in between central anode and uh, end cathodes, we have a set of bipoles. Each bipole will act as a source for magnesium generation. The multipolar cell has the main advantage of high time space yield. That means for a, in a given space and in a given time, 
more metal yield is possible so this uh, cell has been operated at uh, continuously for several days as part of the technology development program to standardize the pro process parameters such as current densities the feeding scheme and collection scheme and tem bath temperature bath level and so on which have successfully metal production of uh, several uh, tons of uh, tons of metal about around 20 tons of magnesium pro produced in the various campaigns with uh, mainly the current efficiency in the multipolar cells the maximum current efficiency achievable is around uh, 60 to 65 percent uh, elsewhere recorded by industry giants dmrl could reach uh, up to 55 percent and the specific energy consumption with a specific energy consumption of 13 to 15 kilowatt hours per kg subsequently the technology was also subjected to little upgradation with the design and development of 8k multipolar cell the salient features of which are, are given here so basically the cell consists of two module and five bipoles on each side cell voltage is around 18 to 22 volts with a standard current density of 0 0.625 amperes per centimeter square and the operating temperature is very crucial because magnesium should be allowed to be in viscous state so as to enable it to float and uh, the higher the temperature oxidation of magnesium is a serious issue so with all these uh, campaigns the technology has been fine-tuned and uh, the photograph of uh, magnesium ingots produced in this cell campaign as shown here However, there are some setbacks in addition to major achievements. Major achievements are first time in the country design, development and operation of multipolar cells conducted at DMRL and uninterrupted cell operations over six months uh, has resulted in the standardization of all cell parameters and understand the various components selected and their performance. Experience gained in the chlorine collection, we, cannot, we could not you uh, uh, utilize the chlorine because chlorine is a hazard chemical unless it is used online the storage there are uh, sanctions and restrictions so we had to neutralize the chlorine gas by hypo neutralization with calcium hydroxide and development of uh, salt bath type furnace for solid MgCl2 to melt and supply hot feed to the metal um, cell these are all the major achievements however we had some setbacks like magnesium metal purity still requires improvement with respect to aluminum impurity there is a quite amount of sludge formation which has to be periodically taken out from the cell during the operations and there is a need to mechanize magnesium collection from the NEZ portion of the cell so the, all these uh, technological issues have been uh, addressed in the recent years we have evolved various solutions to minimize the aluminum pickup by selection of appropriate refractories in the cell wherever magnesium is in touch with the re refractory walls and problems in chlorine cooling system also have been thoroughly examined and foolproof design has been evolved a mechanized collection of magnesium from the cell is being considered by a design and development of a vacuum ladle which is under fabrication currently low current efficiency is mainly due to various types of leaks which and uh, com combination reactions which have been thought upon to provide solutions with respect to improved design of cell internals and improved cell uh, tight leak tightness of the uh, electrolytic cell so the now dmr technology is being considered for establishment of two magnesium pilot projects of 70 metric ton per year capacity one is at uh, zirconium complex tuticorin supported by department of atomic energy where zirconium sponge is produced and in which magnesium chloride is again byproduct and the large quantities of magnesium chloride are thrown out in the environment because there is no recycling facility and KMML where titanium sponge production plant is operating with DMR technology one more magnesium pilot project is under installation so the status of the pilot projects is all civil works completed and major systems of electrolytic cell are under being tendered out the plants are expected to commence in the next one to two years. The uh, last part of my presentation is if what happens is uh, though we able to we recycle entire magnesium chloride produced in the either titanium or zirconium sponge production, we cannot the, meet the re total magnesium requirement for the sponge production. Therefore, we need to have additional MgCl2 quantities to operate separate cells for magnesium production. With this point in view, 
DMRL funded project at uh, for Vignan University Guntur to work on a low uh, vaporization technique for preparation of magnesium chloride anhydrous MgCl2 from seawater bitterns. So in a DMRL funded activity, two uh, sea bitterns from two different sources from Bhavanagar and uh, Tutikorin complex uh, at uh, Tamil Nadu have been taken and process flow sheet was developed in which uh, the impurities of sulfate is removed by calcium chloride addition and iron is removed by hydrogen peroxide addition. All the parameters for these two basic uh, unit operations have been standardized. The typical process flow sheet for uh, preparation of anhydrous MgCl2 with uh, the main uh, feature of this process flow sheet to compare it to the earlier, earlier developed CECR technologies, uh, low temperature spray dryer at a temperature of 260 degrees Celsius, we are able to form anhydrous MgCl2 particulate continuously. So this will, be based on this process flow sheet development, DRDO is interested to take up the activity on pilot scale. These are all the samples produced in the uh, basic research from seawater bitterns, anhydrous MgCl2 produced. And this anhydrous MgCl2 will be the input material for magnesium metal production required for the zirconium and titanium spawn production. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nagesh, for sharing with us, you know, various projects that uh, DRDO uh, uh, has undertaken. So with I that... Know, I'm can... audible. Hello? Yeah. So my presentation is done. I don't know whether it is fully, it was listened to. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, yeah. sir, and you know, we, so we... My presentation here. Sorry? I conclude my presentation here with the last slide showing the MD sealed samples. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank so you. with that, we come to the end of uh, this event, this session. We have we had quite a few questions, but I don't know whether we have time or not. Maybe you know we will take a couple of uh, questions and end it here. So uh, the first first question I would uh, like to put to our experts, whoever would like to take it, is: Can we take up a series of proof of concept and pilot scale studies on bitterns storage? Maybe someone from uh, CSI, uh, CSIR can take it. CSIR, CSMCRI, someone plus uh, from. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, audible. sir. Audible. Yes, CSIR, CSMCRI can take up for you know, this kind of studies. Sir, uh, your sir, audio is very uh, 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 low. Uh, can you low. can you be a bit louder, please? Now it's audible. Yeah, better than yeah, before. Better than before. Yes, 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 can, uh, you know, take up uh, these kind of challenges, uh, how to, you know, conserve the internet, how to process its salt. And we would, we would be very happy to have, you know, pilot uh, studies in this concern. That is fantastic that to, is fantastic uh, to uh, hear, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, my next question, my next question will be, question uh, have we tried selective, we tried selective uh, precipitation uh, route for potash, potash fertilizer? Maybe a preliminary techno uh, commercial due diligence would be useful. What do you say? What 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 is the view of the experts on this? Should we, uh, the institute has done you know a lot of work in this direction. Uh, Mr. Becky is here and he will be throwing some light on this aspect. Please. Please. Actually, the process has been developed long back, and uh, recently the same process. Sir, your voice is not audible, sir, clearly. Is it audible now? Yeah, better, but still very yeah, low, sir. Still very low, sir. Now, if I do speak with you, actually, the process has been developed long back, and uh, there is a very good variance. That we are uh, working with this uh, So definitely, yes, if uh, we find some interest from our industry partners, we can uh, have a deep dive into the technology to understand the economics, technical issues. Or uh, 
थैंक यू सर आई थिंक for this we we will okay. definitely get few uh, corporates and industry partners you know to take it up and maybe collaborate with uh, you to take this forward so we had maybe couple of more questions but i don't think we have the time uh, we are we have already over on the time so uh, uh, i would just uh, give the formal vote of thanks it gives me great pleasure to deliver a, a formal vote of thanks and end of, uh, at the end of this very engaging session I take this opportunity to convey my sincere gratitude to our chief guest, Mr. Satyendra Singh, Additional Secretary and Financial Advisor, Chemicals and Fertilizers, Ministry of Chemicals and Fertilizers, Government of India, for his gracious presence at this forum despite his extremely busy schedule, and enlightening us with his rich insights. My sincere and heartfelt thanks also go to other distinguished speakers for joining us in this very important discussion and sharing with us their valuable insights. I would also like to thank our friends from media for widely covering today's session. On behalf of ICC, I would like to take this opportunity to wholeheartedly thank our partners CSI, CSIR, CSM, CRI, and Arch and Chemicals for their support and cooperation. I think the session could successfully address the key issues and scope regarding marine chemicals industry in India. Here, I would like to highlight a few salient features. Couple of them, maybe. as technologies for seawater bitter develop desalinization concentrate as a source of mineral becomes uh, becomes is likely economical and environmentally viable the economic gain obtained by extracting minerals is likely to increase with increase in the concentration of minerals in the concentrate as well as the market price of these minerals commercial viability has been assessed to be likely for a number of products inclu uh, including bromine chlorine sodium hydroxide magnesium potassium salts and uranium many of which are currently or were historically produced economically from sea water techno economic analysis are also needed to identify target elements and costs for extraction from sea water using a variety of extra extraction approaches these analysis should include costs associated with extraction of a single target element as well as an investigation into how those costs would change in multiple elements could be recovered with the same technology on that note i would once again like to thank everybody for their participation and would like to end this event with that note take care and be safe all of you thank you Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You are nicely organized the event. Thank you, sir. Thank you.